we that's okay. <laughs> um, we share this on our website, which is the Great Lakes Civility Project .com, and um, that's the only place that we do share it. So. Um, anyway, welcome, and this is the Civility Project, and we usually begin by introducing Stephen Henderson and Nolan Finley, and they can share a little bit about how this came to be and what our focus is in building civility. We'll talk a little bit about that um, for the next, you know, 15, 20 minutes. Please put your questions as they arise in the chat, and we will bring up um, some different aspects of civility, and then we're going to have a great opportunity to go into some breakout rooms and have small group discussions. So Stephen and Nolan, would you begin by explaining where the Civility Project came from and what we're trying to do here? Yeah, well, first, um, Lynn, I'd like to just say congratulations to these kids. Uh, what you're doing you know, as first-generation college students at a place like the University of Michigan where you run into your fellow students whose great-grandfathers went to U of M, and you know, you're going there as the first members of your family. I know perfectly well that, what's that like when your parents don't really have the experience uh, to guide you through and help you through. And you know, it's, it's a, a very courageous thing what you all are doing. And I just want to say my congratulations and how much I admire you. And uh, I'll let Steve then start. I think also Nolan sure. I wanted to mention that it's not just University of Michigan, right, Gail? Oh, okay. We also have St. Francis College and Cornell. Correct? Oh, okay. So the Nelson oh, Scholars is expanding, which is really wonderful. Excellent. Yeah, we've got some students from uh, from those other schools with us too, and we want to make sure to to welcome them to this discussion as well. Um, so this just, so, just a minute, yeah. Steve. Everybody should notice your your room. Uh, <laughs> he's got eye marks on his way to room. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> I did Josh, well on the uh, Josh, Twitter, you know, rate my room. <laughs> is it, isn't it nice? <laughs> um, okay, so uh, the, the Civility Project uh, is probably, I think, best described uh, as an opportunity for Nolan and I to take some of the things that we've learned over the last 12 years uh, of being uh, work colleagues and friends uh, and, and try to apply it to uh, a broader audience, try to apply it to uh, lots of other people, uh, share it with lots of other people at a time when, um, when so many people find it difficult to have conversations with uh, or have any sort of relationship with people uh, you disagree with. Um, so I'll start because uh, a lot of you may not have any idea who either of us is uh, by just saying a little about uh, about what that relationship looks like. So uh, when I came back uh, to Detroit, I moved home to Detroit in 2007, um, and uh, Nolan at that time was the editorial page editor of the Detroit News, which is the conservative newspaper here. Uh, in Detroit, and uh, I was brought back as the deputy editorial page editor at the Detroit Free Press, and then uh, a few years later became the editorial page editor at the Detroit Free Press, and that's a much more liberal paper uh, here in Detroit. And so the the, the natural framing for our relationship uh, was was as rivals uh, and as as kind of opposites that that uh, we worked for rival newspapers, we worked for newspapers that came at issues from really different perspectives. Um, and the assumption uh, was always that uh, we would disagree, that we, if you got us together someplace, uh, we, could, we could have a, an argument about, uh, about anything, frankly, uh, about any issue that, that uh, you put in front of us, we would see it differently. Um, and so lots of people uh, took great, great sport in, the, in that idea <laughs> when I got back. Uh, they would put us together on television, uh, or on panels uh, and, and sit back and, and hope to watch us fight. Um, and, and we got good at that. Uh, we're still pretty good at it, frankly. <laughs> if, you, if you throw something out there, uh, we're gonna have a real disagreement about it. But, but over the years, um, I, I think we also uh, grew to appreciate way more about each other uh, than just that, uh, that disagreement. Um, we, we found that those disagreements 
uh, had value of their own and that our ability to have those disagreements, um, even when they become passionate or even sometimes when they become angry, um, uh, that they don't overshadow uh, the value that both of us put on the ability to engage uh, at that level with one another. Uh, I, I think uh, both of us would, would say that uh, we learn a lot from the other, even when we bitterly disagree. Um, we, we sometimes come to, to see things a little bit differently because of the discussions that we have, uh, even though we, I don't think either of us has ever convinced the other uh, to see things 100% uh, his way. Um, uh, but we've also, over, over that time, uh, just come to a place where, where we can talk about anything, uh, no matter how contentious the subject, no matter how passionately uh, either of us feels about it, and actually have a productive exchange about it. Uh, and even when that exchange gets to the point where we decide, look, we can't really talk about this anymore because we are getting too heated, um, we don't ever just quit on it. Uh, we never walk away and say, well, I, I, that's somebody I can't talk to, that's somebody I don't want anything to do with anymore. Um, we have come to value the idea, uh, the very idea of being able, um, being able to have that exchange. And so uh, we started the Civility Project a few years ago as we saw the kind of the, you know, the world around us get more bitter and more, more angry. Uh, you know, the 2016 presidential election, I think was a real turning point um, in the way that conversations take place in this country. It was also a real big turning point, I think for us in realizing how difficult it was for us to have uh, exchanges with other people uh, that, that we used to be able to talk to or argue with. Um, and that, that became uh, more difficult or impossible. Uh, and, and the four years since, of course, things have not gotten better. Uh, I don't think anybody would, would argue that things are easier now than they were uh, at, right after that election. In fact, they, they, a lot of people would say they're much worse. Um, and so we started talking a few years ago about the idea of a project that was, uh, you know, really focused on the idea of uh, encouraging people um, to try to develop these kinds of uh, interactions and relationships. Uh, and, and what we do is talk with groups like this about uh, the things that we've learned, uh, the, the tools that I think we've developed to be able to have that and then hope that that makes a difference, that, that it makes it easier for people um, to identify opportunities to have uh, interactions and exchanges with people they don't agree with. And in fact, uh, to even go so far as uh, to develop friendships with, uh, with people who just uh, don't see things the way you do. And I would say, Lynn, and to the group, we're not trying to create Mr. Rogers' neighborhood here. You know? <laughs> we get after it, and you should get after it. When you, you know, there are times when it, it's required when, you're, when you disagree. What we're trying to do, though, is to encourage people to engage, to engage in good faith across the political divide, to have conversations that may be passionate, may be angry, but are also constructive. And because we, under, and have those conversations with the realization and the understanding that the person you're conversing with is not a monster, not evil, because they don't share your, your feelings, your opinions. There are reasons they don't share your opinions, and we'll get that to that in a little while. But the importance of this is not simply, oh gosh, we'd love everybody to get along a little better and be able to sit down at the Thanksgiving dinner table with their family without, you know, stabbing each other with a fork. The idea here is that, you know, on a, both a macro and a micro level, these conversations are essential to fixing what's broken in America today. You have to be able to, to establish civil conversation before you can reach the point of hashing out pragmatic solutions to the things that ail us. And you have to have, have an understanding of that necessity for give and take and compromise as you work towards consensus. Because if we remain this far apart, and if we continue to divide, and worse, if we continue to dehumanize and hate 
the people we disagree with. We've seen throughout history where that leads to, it leads to some very ugly things. When you, when we come to the point we, where we start thinking the people who hold different opinions from us are less than human. And that's what we're trying in our little corner of the world to head off and to get people to talk about and consider. Yeah, thanks you guys for a great introduction. And I think one thing we can jump into before we do our breakout sessions is that, um, you know, this always sounds great. People get really excited. We see a lot of nodding heads and then they're saying, okay, that sounds nice, but how do I do that? And especially this year is, has been a real doozy. We've had a pandemic that's continuing. We've had a lot of uh, racial turmoil, you know, reach a, a new crescendo. Um, we've had, you know, I mean, it was an election year to begin with, and so we already knew it was going to be something that would be of a, of a challenge. Um, and I thought maybe we could start by talking about practical steps that people could take to build civility. And I think I'd like to start by even bringing social media into this, because I think mm -hmm. that um, that's really important. I think of all of us on this and the session can relate to that, that you know, we're on social media and almost in little bubbles. And I think that that is one of the um, problems that leads to incivility. So let's talk about some of the practical steps that people can take to build civility and how social media affects that as well, if you don't mind. Yeah, Nolan, you go first. Starts with trust. You've got to establish a platform of trust and understanding. So you've got to get to the place where you're comfortable enough with the person you're engaging with that you don't fear, oh my God, I might say the wrong thing and boom, my life is over. That you, you, you have to get to the point where you trust that the other person wants to have an honest conversation. And the way Steve and I did it, and I'll let him talk to you about that in a little more, is, is we sat down in a story course session and really tried to get at the experiences that shaped our lives and turned one of us into a conservative and one of us into liberal because we didn't come from the backgrounds so different as you might expect. It's not sort of, you know, you know white uh, uh, conservative elite country club and you know, uh, African American urban poverty. I mean, there's, there was a closer sort of range than that, much, much closer. And we took the time to learn about those, that background and those experiences and what values we apply to our decision making and our opinion for me. And I think it was a really useful experience. Again, I'll let Steve talk more about that. But you have to stab, you have to first, and we do little exercises when we speak to groups to encourage them to get to know each other as beings beyond their politics to establish that trust level so there's comfort. So you can put really dangerous issues on the table and not be afraid to talk about them. Uh, that's the number one thing is, or the first step, is establishing that trust. Yeah, um, uh, you know, as Nolan said, we, we did this StoryCorps exercise, which, uh, which I, I sort of came up with um, uh, when StoryCorps came to Detroit. Uh, and, and for those who aren't familiar, StoryCorps is an NPR uh, program that goes around the country and invites people to come uh, and tell their story about uh, their relationship with someone that they choose. Um, uh, how, did they, how did they meet? How do they keep things uh, uh, going? What were some sort of uh, points of tension in, in the relationship? Uh, and, you know, mostly people take their families or they take their spouses uh, and do this. And I decided that uh, instead of that, I was going to take Nolan with me. I said, we're going to go down there and, and talk for an hour about, uh, about and why I, we get along. And it was in a little Winnebago parked on the, the <laughs> Institute of Art Yard. And I get there and I'm thinking, oh, some Mars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit of a strange experience. <laughs> much more, much more. Yeah. Than that. <laughs> but we sat in that Winnebago, and I said, "Let's not talk about, you know, we're used to talking about things that divide us, the things that we don't agree on. We do that all the time." I said, "Instead, let's talk about where all that comes from. Uh, let's talk about why we believe the things we believe, and let's talk about where we believe those things come from." 
Uh, and so we sat there and both told our stories uh, about where we'd grown up and the families we came from and uh, how values were established and, and how we took all of that and came up with, with who we were. Um, you know, the idea there was, of course, establishing that trust, but it was also sort of backing away from some of the things that I think drive political discourse right now, right? Um, this was an opportunity to, to not think about how to convince the other person that they're wrong and that, the, uh, that, that, that you're right. Uh, this was a way to back away from uh, some of the, the incentive to try to embarrass somebody that you're in a, in a discussion or an argument with uh, by showing how much more you know than they do, or how little they know in co in, in comparison, um, it was it was an effort to kind of decharge the situation, uh, remove some of that that um, that negative power, and try to find um, try to find common common ground, try to find things that that um, that we didn't know about each other that actually connect us in a more profound way than the things the, that that divide us. And so that trust, uh, you know, we, we had known each other for about a decade when we went to do that. Uh, we already had a fair amount of trust, but but I think that was a real turning point in, in the way that we interact with each other because we both learned things about the other that we didn't know before. And we saw things that connected us uh, that we certainly were not um, aware of before. And I would say that it allowed us to be friends. Um, it, it, it made it okay for us to be friends because going into that, you know, we were friends. I, I don't want to suggest we weren't. And we knew that, you know, we were um, drawn to each other and we enjoyed talking to each other and all that. But there was something okay, not okay about that. Um, not necessarily in our eyes, but in the eyes of other people say, oh, how can you two how can you talk to him? How can you be out drinking with him and having dinner, blah, 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 going to ball games? It allowed us to sort of to discover why we were drawn to each other and why we could be, be friends. It was like a big permission slip, I would say. So it's great to start by establishing trust and get to know the person behind the politics. Uh, what else do we recommend? Mm -hmm. so Something about yeah. listening might come into that picture, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, we talk about kind of core principles um, when we talk about civility, the things that, that kind of build the, the idea, the framework for civility. And, and that we always start with, with the idea of listening. Um, and when we, when we say that word, uh, I, I think we're saying something really different than the way um, it's sort of commonly understood, uh, you know, especially in arguments. Uh, I think uh, we always think we're listening if we're not talking. If we're letting the other person talk uh, and, and keeping quiet, that means we're listening. But we may be sitting there, uh, you know, judging what that person is saying and thinking, uh, you know, thinking bad things about what they're saying. Or we might be sitting there thinking about what we're going to say next when that person finally stops talking. You know, what's my next, my next point? Um, when we talk about listening, we are really talking about focusing on what the other person is saying and not just what they're saying, but really trying to, to hear what's behind it. Uh, why does this person believe the things that they're saying? Where is this coming from? And, uh, you know, and, and resisting that, that urge uh, that, that I think is in, at this point, a societal urge uh, to, to, to try to shut that other person down, um, to, try to, to try to take away from that person's points rather than sort of listening and trying to, to, to build your own off of them. Um, it's a really practiced uh, exercise. I mean, it's something that you have to really try to do. I find still that I've got to force myself uh, to do it, not just with Nolan, but with other people I'm in debates or arguments with to, to, to quiet yourself, right? Quiet yourself in your own head uh, and really pay attention to what the other person uh, is saying. I, I also say that, that uh, since we're talking to a group that includes a lot of students from the University of Michigan, you know, this is something that 
I remember learning a lot about when I was there at the university. Um, I, was, uh, I was a student and uh, so was Lynn. Uh, Lynn was a classmate of mine at the university as well. Um, Michigan Daily we, together. Yeah, yeah, right. We were both uh, staffers at the Michigan Daily, uh, which is, uh, is now, as it was then, the, 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 the largest student newspaper on campus. I know there are another, a number of other publications now. Um, but inside the Michigan Daily and certainly outside the Daily, we found ourselves constantly in a state of, of argument. Uh, and, and we often had really, really bitter uh, awful arguments about things. Uh, uh, one of the one of the biggest arguments I remember us having uh, 30 years ago was about uh, whether to capitalize uh, the B in black when it refers to black people. Uh, there was uh, an all-nighter uh, uh, argument about how and whether to do that. Uh, one of the one of the other ideas that uh, that I now kind of chuckle about. Uh, we had an all-night fight about uh, whether to get rid of the sports section of the newspaper and instead have uh, what we called a an environmental section. Uh, Are you been... crazy? <laughs> <laughs> Today we would call that climate change. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but we went all night about that, right? Uh, what was more important, the people playing sports or, or, or the fact that the climate was changing in a way that uh, human life might not be uh, sustainable on the planet. Um, well, without football, what would it matter? <laughs> well, and without football, what would pay for the, uh, the, the, the cost of the newspaper, right? Yeah. Sports, uh, drove, uh, sports drove everything revenue-wise, as it does mm -hmm. in most newspapers. Um, but we, we, we learned, I think, a lot in, the, in, in that time about Sorry, I how to argue. Um, and and how not to argue in a in a in a way that that left things uh, so tattered that you couldn't bring them back together. And listening was a big part of that. Now we weren't great at it because we were young and we were uh, very strong-headed, and then people's feelings got hurt a lot. But I think all of us were made bad, better by the opportunity uh, uh, to do that. Um, and so and listening was a huge huge part of that. Um, the, other, the other core principle we talk about though with, with civility is, is that commitment to continuing the conversation, always continuing the conversation. So even when you reach the point uh, with somebody that you've got to stop because it is getting too bitter or too passionate and you've stopped having, you know, kind of a productive exchange, you walk away saying, all right, well, but I'll see you the next time we want to talk about this and I will come back to this conversation uh, with an open mind. Um, you know, that's something that's harder and harder right now, I feel like, because of the, 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 the culture that we live in. Uh, social media, uh, the 24-hour cable news cycle, uh, these things kind of encourage the idea of shutting down uh, opposition, of, of walking away from things we don't agree with or people we don't agree with and, and saying, I'm just not gonna engage with that person anymore, right? The, the block button on Facebook or on Twitter, uh, where not only do you do, you do it, you, you, know, you block somebody, but then you announce to everybody else, I block this person, right? Uh, it's almost like you're rewarded for doing that. Um, or you think on, on cable news of how often they reward just, uh, uh, terrible bitter argument with no real productive end um, that's what people watch and that's what they sort of uh, book um, we really are asking people I think to, to try to pull away from that and pull away from those instincts uh, to be able to have conversations with each other um, over a longer period of time and and admit that sometimes they are uh, difficult and bitter um, but and sometimes you got to walk away from them in the moment, but you never walk away uh, for good. You say, well, uh, the, the, the exchange itself is the reason I'm here, not uh, the, some idea of winning or losing. And so uh, I'll be back for more. And Lynn, if I, if I could add to that, um, a conversation is not a competition. And you need to get that in your head going in. Set honest goals 
with the conversation. And that goal shouldn't be, I'm really going to win. I'm going to really destroy that person. I'm going to rub their, their nose in, in this. Um, set an honest goal. And that goal should be to try to gain understanding. You already know how you feel. You already know what your arguments are, and what shape your opinions. Enter a conversation trying to figure out what motivates the other person. What, what is it about their arguments that you might, you know, you might find some interest in, you might learn some, but something from. But don't go in thinking, I'm going to win this. This is a, this is a competition and I'm going to, you know, come out on top. That, that's not fun for anybody. You know, go in with an honest heart in terms of, I want to know what you think and why. And maybe I can take something from what you think and shape, better shape my uh, opinion or better inform my opinion. Steve and I have been going at back and forth for years now. I've given up on trying to convert him. It's not going to happen. But every time I talk to him, I come away thinking, hmm, you know, I learn a little something. And it may not be something I agree with, but it's something that I might use to hone my own opinions, you know, to check my own self. Start with the idea that you might not be right, yeah. you know, that you can learn and you can learn from any situation and don't shut yourself off from opinions that you might find offensive even, or that you might find just wholly against your own belief system. Uh, listen and see what you can learn and have that honest goal in mind from the start. And you'll be surprised how, how much enjoyment you can get out of that. Yeah. You know, uh, another point I'd make, and this is, I think, really important because so uh, we're talking with a group of students uh, and students uh, on, on the campus there in Ann Arbor, which uh, is now, as it was when I was there, a pretty activist campus. I mean, there's a lot of very strong voices uh, present there. And, you know, protest is uh, an important tool uh, of, of those voices. And sometimes when we talk about civility, I think uh, people too often think that uh, you, you have to make a choice between civility and uh, strong activism or or protest or strong voice. Uh, in fact, we're saying the opposite of that. Uh, this is this is something that um, that you can do um, and, and maintain uh, all of the, the the passion and anger uh, that that drives some of that uh, voice and protest. I mean, uh, we'd be crazy in this year with everything that has happened. Uh, with everything that is happening, with everything that we're finally talking about uh, in terms of systemic racism and inequality to suggest that, uh, you know, the people stifle themselves somehow uh, and not express feelings uh, and, and emotions and, and ideas that, that have been a long time in coming in terms of uh, being taken seriously. What we're saying is uh, you can do that, but you can still, and you still must, be able to engage in a reasonable argument or dialogue with people who don't agree with you because that is the way that we move forward. We can't do it on our own. We've, we've got to be able to, to pull in people who think differently but who have the same uh, uh, kinds of values and ideas in their minds about where we all want to get to, um, even if they might disagree with the path. Um, yeah. to be able to, to have that exchange. And I, I would stress I the importance of that in terms of there's a lot of people coming to this conversation today who coming with a good heart, but no clue what to do or, you know, no, trying to shape their opinions. You've got to give them a chance to express themselves and be willing to engage in a back and forth discussion in which they might say something completely that you feel completely inappropriate but you know they're coming there with this honest goal of learning and growing and you've got to encourage that not shut it down if you think about the world the places where only one opinion is allowed only one opinion is okay only one party is okay those are not very good places we have to have that back and forth 
Absolutely. So we're going to go into breakout rooms in just a minute. I wanted to also add something from that you guys talk about a lot with the art of listening is a learned skill. And so it doesn't matter if you're younger, or older, middle-aged, there are lots of people who do not listen well and who don't, do not know how. And so what Stephen and Nolan often talk about is the listening is something that you're, you're not planning your retort, you're not waiting to jump in, you're just really listening fully to the other person, asking probing questions, because you know you'll have a turn. And so that's just a skill that we can build at any age. So now um, I want to ask um, Kayla for a little bit of help, because what we're going to want to do is put people in breakout rooms of four to five people in a group. And I don't have um, access to ask the questions. And so I'm going to put it in the chat quickly, but um, then maybe we can transmit it to the groups uh, when you do the breakout groups. And so um, what we want to do is um, in these groups, have an honest conversation, give some time for everybody to have a chance to speak. And the question that you want to discuss is what are your political beliefs and how or what in your background led you to these beliefs? And we just sort of want to explore that. Um, we'll do a second breakout session a little bit later in this, in this program, and it's going to look more at personal values. So we're starting kind of big, like, why do I believe what I believe? How did I get here? And just trying to explore that and understand that from each other. So we're going to have about um, 10 minutes in these breakout room sessions. And then when you come back, what I'd love to do, Kayla, is have um, the grid so that people can jump in and share what happened in the group and um, you know, sort of deconstruct a little bit um, if we can do that when they come back. So um, does that sound good? We'll go into breakout sessions. Hey, thanks, Lynn. Yep. Um, this is Kayla speaking now. I have the rooms all queued up. Um, so I'm going to open them up and you'll have 60 seconds to join and then I will make sure to broadcast that question out to all of the groups. So I'm opening the rooms now. How are we doing, Lynn? I think it's great. I think it's going really well. I saw a lot of nodding heads, which is good, so. <laughs> Ardiana keeps wanting to come back. Some people aren't joining the groups, I guess. They'll, they'll um, be placed there after, I think it's like 20 more seconds. If you don't mind, I probably won't participate. Usually I like to just sort of stay out of that oh okay yeah yeah I can Nolan always likes to but um Nolan always goes in I feel like it's a little it's a little heavy-handed sometimes like if yeah. we're in there people won't be as like big brothers there yeah uh oh the program people are in now we have to be on our best behavior so hey, Kayla mm -hmm. uh yes. I was in a breakout room with a few people but then it emptied and it was just me in there who is this David Offenbacher Okay, let me try to move you here. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. It looks like Ardiana may also need to be moved and Kiera Davis. They're just not joined. They're though. just maybe cho choosing not to attend. And welcome back, everyone. So cool to see everyone just populate the screen. It's very cool. So wait for everyone to come back in and then I would love to invite people to share what happened in their group. So we'll just give it another minute for everyone to come back and then we'd love to hear from you if you'd like to share. Sometimes the groups are so successful that people just want to stay in the very last second. So um, that is really cool too. So when you come back, if you could mute your microphone until such time as you are going to offer some input about your experience, that'd be great. 
and we have what 75 is that right so we'll wait until we see that number come back in the participants That's a great number. Isn't it? I'm impressed. I am too. How many Kessler Scholars do you have in total? We have about 150 um, overall four years. Okay, that's amazing to get half of them on this program. Mm -hmm. I think this is where we're at for now. So I think everybody has joined and this is, this awesome. is the amount we're with. Great. Okay. So what we'd like to do is take about five or 10 minutes to hear um, from you about what the experience was like in the breakout rooms. Um, so we just want to hear, you know, what, how did the conversation go? Um, what would, what did it feel like? Who would like to share something about their experience? You can just unmute yourself and start talking. Uh, I would like to go if that's okay. Thank you. Yes. So uh, all of us in the group were uh, between undecided or moderate or left leaning. And it was all for different reasons. It wasn't just a single, this is what we believe and we're either unsure or um, we all came from the same background. Like we all came from rather different backgrounds, but um, just hearing the different reasons why we developed those beliefs was really interesting. Cool, thank you so much, Cynthia. Who else would like to share their experience? Um, I can go. Thank you. Um, so in my group, we discussed political views and I felt that as I was sharing personally that everyone was really understanding and actually hearing what I had to say. I was discussing more of the, more so the civility part of it of let's keep things civil and they all agreed and it, I did not feel judged or anything like that. I felt it was actually very productive to discuss where we came from and how we came from there and why we think how we do. Awesome. That is so great to hear, Nicholas. Thank you so much. Who else? So, um, hello, my name is Adriana. Um, so I joined my group just a little late because I had to run an errand, but um, from the time that we have talked, um, we really just focused on what kind of like made us view that uh, political stance. And so what I talked about was um, not only my identity and my experiences like shaped my view, but also like where I grew up. I grew up in a low income area. I grew up in a very diverse area as well. So a lot of people were understanding of different backgrounds. And so there really wasn't that many, I guess, opposing views in my area, because we were all kind of in this together. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what I explained to my group and it kind of just went from there, so. Very cool. Thank you so much, Adriana. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Anybody else like to pop in? Anybody else? I could say that in my group, mm -hmm. there was quite a few people who came from more of a conservative background and we kind of had to learn on our own that like we had different views from like our parents or maybe or, like our family or friends. And it was kind of could feel like we were on the outside sometimes because we came from such a conservative area. But like, even though we were in that environment, we just discerned that those weren't necessarily the views that aligned with what we believed. That's really brave. And um, I think some people can feel nervous to share different perspectives or different details of their background. So I'm so glad that your group was supportive and it's great that it was a productive conversation. Thank you so much, Luke. Anybody else? Yeah, from my group, uh, Bianca brought up a really good point that um, like just sharing like for however long we were sharing, you like, learn a lot like you're like oh i didn't even think about that just like in that little small segment which is just incredible just like talking to people and just being open-minded i think that really just outlaying the perspective of how you got there just really helps to empathize like that's not just comes out of the blue it actually like there's some thought behind it um it really helps you just like open up your mind and think about it which is that's really cool thank you so much dallas i appreciate that 
So one thing that I think we might uh, spend a little bit of time very quickly, Stephen and Nolan, on before we go into our second breakout session. Sure. Is, um, I'd like for each of you to take maybe a minute or two to share a little bit about your own background and then maybe some perspective on how you know you come from a lot of different details. You do share some common ground, but some different um, origins. How were you able to then build a friendship and build civility? So if we could, you could each take a few minutes to sh tell us more about yourself and your background and then how you managed to bridge any gaps that were there to build your relationship. Uh, Nolan, why don't you go first? Yeah, I mean, we have, as we said, I mean, it's obvious we have different back backgrounds. And, you know, when we talked in that story course session about what, uh, what shaped our, our values, what, what shaped, uh, what, you know, why I became a conservative and he became a liberal. I mean, I came from very modest means to say the least, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I was born in a house that didn't have running water in, you know, the hills of Kentucky. And it, I've had to scrap all my life, you know, to, to get anything. I mean, you, you all are first generation college students. I was a first generation high school student. Nobody ever in my family had graduated from high school. And, you know, I, I come from an area of the world where, there's a lot of mistrust of the government because the people there have been run over by the government for, you know, generations. And so, you know, basically the values my parents instilled in me was anything you get, you're going to have to get yourself and you can only depend on yourself. And so it was very much a self-reliant uh, uh, value they instilled me. And so that fits very well, you know, into the conservative viewpoint. I just want the government to leave me be, you know, and, uh, you know, my parents were very, uh, even when times got pretty hard, were very, very reluctant to take help from anyone. I remember my dad was on strike for nine months and it was a difficult time and you know we had to go to the union hall and get those government commodities and i can remember my mother how in shame she was um putting those silver cans on the shelf and putting that government cheese in the refrigerator and she didn't she put it so nobody who might come in the house would see it it was a very traumatic experience for 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 her and for our family and it shaped obviously my feelings toward a union because you know we almost went under uh in a strike that was you know completely pointless and so those are the kinds of experience you grow up with that shape your life i never wanted anyone to speak on my behalf in the workplace i wanted to speak for myself uh and, you know, I've never wanted anybody to sort of give me anything, but I didn't want anybody to keep me from getting anything that um, I felt I had worked for and uh, earned, you know. So, you know, those are the values that shape, that shape me. And, you know, I believe in uh, the individual, the power of the individual in a smaller government, smaller, less improvement government. I, I think if left alone, people will make the right choices for themselves and their families. I believe in people and in these, particularly the, uh, the goodness of people. Thanks, Nolan. Stephen, if you can jump in, and I don't want to take too long because we want to get back to the breakout sessions, but we'd love to hear about you too. Sure. Um, so uh, my family uh, on both sides, uh, my mom and my dad, um, you know, are, are pretty uh, uh, typical stories uh, of, of African-American migration uh, in, the, in the 20th century, leaving the segregated uh, South 
uh, to try to get north for better opportunities. Um, on my mother's side, my grandfather uh, graduated high school, but was, of course, unable to go to college because he couldn't be admitted to colleges um, because he was African-American. Uh, my father uh, grew up in Mississippi. Um, uh, when I grew up, joined the Air Force and served in the Korean War, um, but came home to Mississippi and was unable to vote. Uh, even though he was a veteran, uh, was unable to even sit at a lunch counter uh, in, in downtown Natchez, uh, and of course was then also denied uh, the GI Bill, which uh, is the path for so many families uh, in the 40s and 50s out of uh, poverty into the middle class, uh, the, the ability to go to college, uh, the ability to buy a home, uh, you know, Blacks were not allowed to buy homes in places where the GI Bill applied. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's uh, the, the story of my life is uh, my family on both sides trying to get to a better space, uh, trying to get to the North where they felt like there would be better opportunities, but also uh, where uh, trying to, 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 uh, to craft the tools that would make life better for me. Uh, so my grandfather was uh, a very active union member and, and ended up being a very close aide to Walter Ruther, uh, who is the founder of the UAW. Uh, that's how that side of my family gets to Detroit. Um, he's deeply involved in the civil rights movement. In fact, the, the photo of uh, Martin Luther King marching here in Detroit in 1963, giving his uh, on his way to give the I Have a Dream speech first here before he gives it in Washington, uh, you can see my grandfather off to the right of uh, Dr. King with Walter Ruther and uh, uh, other figures there. Um, uh, he, you know, the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, of course, make equality possible legally for my family and, and for me. And so that shapes my sense of the world, of course, uh, as I'm growing up in the 1970s uh, and 80s. And, you know, what's interesting is, you know, African Americans have as much distrust of government uh, as anybody, you know, poor whites in the South, like no one said, had, had different reasons to, to distrust the government. But it is that um, I, I think one of the differences is how we interpret that mistrust. Uh, we mistrust it in action, not in principle. I think uh, African Americans are strong believers in the idea that the promises of equality uh, in the founding documents of this country are, 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 are powerful and that government has to be there to enforce that equality, that if you pull the government away, uh, from that, then, then we get the, the, the short end of the stick. Um, uh, you know, um, and so the idea of animating government uh, on behalf of equality is, is one of the things that, um, that strongly motivates me and I think uh, lots of other, uh, other liberals, but, but also the grander idea that, um, that equality uh, is the mission, it's the call uh, of, of this time and of this country. It's the thing that has never gotten right. Um, and, and that each of us has an obligation uh, to push to make sure that, uh, that, that, those, things, uh, that those things happen. Uh, you know, Nolan and I would agree that, that opportunity is, is everything and that people ought to be free to pursue opportunity without hindrance from government or other uh, other people. And that's some of the, th the things I think that pull us together is that we have the same ideas in mind about where people ought to end up. The question is, how did they get there? And, and a lot of that has to do with history that, that uh, you know, our histories uh, are different largely because uh, of, of our racial backgrounds that, that poor whites and poor blacks just have really different uh, experiences that lead them to to now and the things that we're, we're trying to achieve. Awesome. Thank you so much. So um, because we only have 30 minutes left, we want to do one more breakout session and then um, 
debrief and ask questions. So I know you guys probably have questions. So what we're gonna do is if Kayla, you could put people back in the same rooms. Um, we're gonna ask you, and I just put it in the chat and we'll broadcast it as well. What are your ideas for building civility within our social spaces? And so I'm really excited to hear what you guys come up with. Um, and so we'll do, um, let's do eight minutes because we are running out of time. So if we could go back into those breakout uh, rooms, that would be awesome. And um, then we'll be excited to hear what you guys discuss. And I'm not able to place them in the same room. Oh, goodness. Okay. Uh, well, then we'll be in new rooms. So meet new people. <laughs> oh, no. Come up with ideas for building civility. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, no worries. Okay. So um, I'm putting you into breakout rooms now. I will broadcast the message again. See you in about 10, 15 minutes. So Kayla, let's do eight minutes if that's okay. Eight minutes. Yes. And then you can also remove me from the. Hello. <laughs> Hello again. Welcome back, everybody. I think we can probably jump in. Um, okay, so we have 20 minutes, guys, and it's um, we're really eager to hear the ideas you came up with, but also I want to invite you to offer questions. I'm sure you have questions brimming for Stephen and Nolan. So let's use our time together that's remaining, both to offer what happened and transpired in your breakout session, but also any questions you would like them to answer as well. I can uh, go again. Thanks. Um, so we had the discussion more so of to the civility of gain through conversation. And so what we kind of touched upon was that um, it, it was very important to kind of establish a foundation of the conversation and not stray too far to make someone uncomfortable. And so what I mean by that is it's very easy for someone, myself included, to like feel attacked when talking about politics. Like even the word politics, I'm like, oh boy. And you know, so I think it's very important to identify what points are going to get people at each other like dogs and just more so just how about we take it down and we just discuss wh whatever else we can and just really just try and keep it more civil against ourselves, I guess. But I know that was, that was a very general explanation, but that's like what I have right now. I'm sorry. Oh, it's great. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's yeah, and I would, I would like to comment on that. I think that's not a bad approach to sort of work your way up to the most difficult position. Talk through the things that perhaps are easier first. Now, you eventually got to get to that hard place, but work your way up to it. And I think that's, you know, starting with starting with things that that, um, you know, are kind of safe for, for everybody it makes a lot of um, makes a lot of sense. It makes people comfortable uh, you know, getting to these other getting to these other things. And it builds that trust, that word that we kind of started this conversation with, which is trust. Um, being able to to feel comfortable exchanging really difficult ideas with somebody else. Uh, if you build that trust first, uh, the rest of it comes easier. Yeah. Amber, were you going to jump in? Uh, yeah. Um, I'd like to build off of what uh, Mr. Henderson had said. Uh, I definitely agree that uh, people tend to um, People like to be comfortable in their view, in uh, where they're at. Uh, if you think about it, human beings, are just, it's just human nature to be a little bit complacent and it's easy to uh, wanna share the same views as somebody else and fit in. 
but it's also important uh, from a very, very young age, we should be taught that um, there are definitely different perspectives in the world. Um, and there's different viewpoints, there's different ways to live. And uh, no matter what, uh, as long as you aren't impeding on anybody's unalienable rights, um, you have a right to hold those opinions. A really good point, Amber. And I think that's hard for parents to do sometimes if they are really staunch in their beliefs and they want, they think they're, I think one of the things Stephen and Nolan say all the time is that people usually come from a place of good intention and want the same outcomes, um, but they may have different ways of getting there. So that benefit of the doubt is probably super important too. Right, guys? Well, also evolve and change. I mean, you all are not going to be 20 years from now or 30 years from now, where you are today. Uh, you're going to learn, you're going to grow, you're going to, and, and hopefully you'll do that all your life. I'm certainly not where I am on a lot of issues, the same place I was 10 years ago even. Um, and you've got to be open to that sort of growth and that, uh, that willingness to weigh uh, other ideas and apply different experiences and the times to your opinions and move to different places as, uh, you know, as, as necessitated. Who else would like to share either some ideas you came up with in your group or maybe have a question for Stephen and Nolan? Um, I could touch on some things that we discussed in our group. So, Great. yeah. Um, so one of my group members came up with the idea of just really um, being open to being friends with people who are unlike you. Cause I feel like we just focus so much more on our similarities rather than our differences that often we don't really cherish these differences or we're afraid to sort of express these differences. So um, we agreed on branching out and finding people who are different from us and getting to know them and discussing um, topics, uh, which also goes into our second point, uh, discussing uh, and normalizing, uh, discussing difficult, having difficult conversations. Because um, I feel like in the American culture, it's, we find that with everyone coming from multiple different cultures, that it's very easy to uh, feel that you, they feel that you could possibly um, offend people and they, they try to stray away from that. And with that, you're taking away very important conversations that could be ha held. Uh, so we wanted to normalize having those conversations in, in our daily lives. Those are really great points. Thank you so much for sharing them. That's wonderful. Do you guys have anything you wanted to say to that, Stephen or Nolan? Yeah, I think, Go ahead. The, you know, you're in such a great and unique situation as a student at the University of Michigan to be able to do that. Um, you know, I, I remember when I was a student there that, that, that one of the things that I just uh, was always sort of um, so impressed with and, and almost overwhelmed by was how many different kinds of people <laughs> there were on campus. Uh, who, who I wouldn't have known, uh, who I would never have had a chance to interact with um, back here in Detroit. You know, I mean, Detroit's a pretty diverse place itself, but but there's nothing like, uh, you know, a university that brings people from literally all over the country and, and in some cases all over the world to one space for a common idea, which is uh, education. Um, and, and, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, there, there are dynamics on campus often that, that squelch the idea of that diversity. It's hard for, for many kids who, who, don't, um, who don't see a lot of themselves uh, at the university sometimes to, to reach out and, and kind of pull in on that, uh, on that diversity. But, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's an experience you won't match somewhere else. Uh, this is really once in your life that, that you'll be in that kind of uh, environment. And, um, and if, you can, if you can learn from that, if you can do it there, 
I feel like it's such an advantage when you uh, when you get out in the the rest of the world. Yeah, don't get intellectually flabby. You know, test your ideas. Uh, don't get um, complacent. I think these five things or these ten things, and that's where I'm going to be. You know, test yourself. Test your ideas. Learn from each other. You're in the perfect environment for it. Thank you so much. Who else would like to share um, what you came up with or have a question for Stephen and Nolan? Um, I'd like to share. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say, like, I feel like in this this current generation, we have like this established like cancel culture where anybody who doesn't agree with like the mass or majority of people were so quick to condemn. And I feel like, especially for universities, the whole point is for people from all over the world or all over wherever they're from to come wow. and be able to learn and have a um, conversation. And I feel like we've forgotten that part where everything is so united, we forget like it's, it's okay to talk about differences and that behind politics, there are people. Mm -hmm. People have stories, people have reasons. And even though people can have two different beliefs that um, diverge from a common experience, so I would say it's important to just create spaces for people to just come and talk and feel comfortable with talking. That's great. I love that phrase, behind politics there are people. That's one that I, I'm going to remember. No much. Thank you, for that. you know, Len, you've heard me tell this story so many times, but uh, I'll share it again. Uh, one, of the, one of the sort of uh, seeds of this civility project, where the idea first came from, Steve and I were at a a conference once on Mackinac Island. It was a Republican conference and he was there covering it. And of course he was, uh, uh, you know, it was a difficult place for him to be, but he and I <laughs> drinking at the bar and uh, I walk away and I run into these two women who, um, very conservative women, they were running a conservative website and they grabbed me and they said, ha, how could you be spending so much time with him? How could you be friends with him? He's so awful. We just hate him. And they used that word, hey, startled me. And I said, do you know him? And they said, no. I said, can you talk to him? I said, no. I said, well, go on over there. He's standing there alone and talk to him. Do me th that favor. Go over there and talk to him. Two hours later, <laughs> I had to pull them away from him, pull him away from them. And they, they walked away. They said, ah, oh, he's so great. We just love him. Now, his opinions hadn't changed. Their opinions hadn't changed but they'd taken time to know him as something beyond his politics. And Steve and I get this every day where people say, oh, we hate you. I get the most vile emails. <laughs> and, I don't even see, and you know, if I had a thin skin, it might hurt my feelings, but uh, <laughs> we get the most awful, hateful emails. People think they hate us based on our political expressions and our opinions, know nothing about us. And I would urge everyone, if you find yourself saying, I hate <laughs> this person or that person because of what you heard them say or what, you, what you've read, back way far away from that and, and get a grip on yourselves because you shouldn't, you shouldn't hate people you don't know and you haven't taken the time to understand. You may hate what they say, that's fine. You may hate what they write, but to think that you hate, you know enough about them based on that to actually hate them, it's a very dangerous place. We have about eight minutes left. Um, what questions have not been answered that um, we can give some attention to? Anybody have a question for if, if we if we don't have a question, I, I want to say something about the, the the couple of students who uh, kind of self identified as uh, as conservatives uh, on campus and and you know kind of give a shout out to them to uh, to to participating in this and to to leaning into the idea of trying to to have a dialogue, you know. Uh, the campus is a pretty liberal place uh, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, there are uh, not as many students who would identify as conservative as there should be. A lot of students who I think would identify as conservative are sometimes 
a little shy about doing that uh, because of the reaction that they think that uh, they're going to get. And, and this kind of exercise is exactly the thing uh, that, that we need, uh, you know, students of all political beliefs, but especially conservatives uh, participating in so that, uh, so that your views are part of um, uh, the dialogue on campus uh, and, and that uh, you don't feel marginalized uh, much the way, for instance, African-American students, you know, when I was a student there, uh, you know, just like now, there weren't a lot of African-American students. I can remember how hard it was to be a minority uh, and, and stand up for yourself uh, up there. But I think conservative students uh, experience that in a really different way. And so I was really glad to see um, some conservative students here and, and speaking up tonight. And you conservative students, go, don't go changing. <laughs> no one needs you. <laughs> well, this is great. So um, if anybody has more questions, now's your chance. Um, if not, I'd love to invite you. Um, we send out a monthly email that just gives ideas for continuing to build civility and other programs we're doing. If you'd like to be on it, um, please put your email in the chat and I'd love to add you to it. Um, it's just once a month. We don't sell anything. We just like to keep the conversation going. Um, and this is something that we do. Um, we're actually now planning into the beginning of 2021 for programs. And since we're on Zoom, we can bring them anywhere. So if you have um, a community back home that you think would really benefit from this and you think your parents or um, somebody you know, a, a pastor or someone um, would like to bring this to, your, to their your home community, please let me know and I'd be happy to do that. So any last uh, comments or anything? No, it's been great. I've really enjoyed being with you all. And again, I'm very proud of what you're doing. Uh, hang in there. You'll get to the end. You know, just scrap. Gail put a question in the chat posing to Stephen and Nolan um, regarding the debate that was supposed to be held on the U of M campus tonight. And do you think we lose anything by not having them meet tonight? Lord have mercy if it was anything like the last debate. I don't think we did. <laughs> so we figured we'd throw that easy question at you right before we go. No, no see, I, I actually I actually disagree. I think as bad as the last debate was, it's better that we have them than that we don't. Think about think about the the, the state of our political dialogue that we want to yeah. stop the debates rather than rather than fix them. We need to find a moderator who can uh, keep control uh, and get them to focus and we need the, the participants to act better. But, but you know, this would have been an extraordinary event uh, in Ann Arbor if this had actually yeah. happened. Yeah. I was really looking forward to it. Um, and of course, I think it was COVID that derailed that one, right? Um, yeah, well, yeah, right. The president, they wanted to do it virtually and the president said he didn't. No, I meant the one, at, the one at U of M. You that would have been this one tonight. Yeah, yeah. but or was it supposed to be here tonight? Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, it's too bad. It would have been good for the university. But I, I got about uh, halfway through the last one. I was thinking, <laughs> Lord, shoot up here amongst us. One of us has got to have some relief, you know. <laughs> you lasted longer than we did, Nolan. Five minutes in, I'm like, I can't eat Ooh, that. Lord. <laughs> but, you know, I would just put this in some perspective for the for the young folks out there who are still with us, uh, you know, we'll get through this. When I was your age, when I was in college, we were in the midst of the anti-war movement, the anti-Vietnam War protests. The country was literally coming apart at the seams. Think about this. Students were being killed on American campuses by their own government. We were in a horrible place. Uh, we got through it, you know, we went from there to disco and, you know, we can probably do <laughs> So we have dancing ahead of us. That's, that's promising. Right, yeah. That's good. <laughs> well, thank you so much to the Kessler Scholars. Thanks as always to Delta Dental for sponsoring this and making this possible. And I really want to thank all of you students for giving us an hour and a half of your time. It's a really long amount of time and it's been amazing to see you guys here and hear from you. And um, if we can help you in any way, let us know. I'll put my email in the chat and you can always reach out if you'd like to. I just wanna jump in with one last final thought. 
Yes. Um, I just want to confirm for all of you guys that we have been taking attendance. So this does count towards your participation <laughs> credit. So don't worry about oh, that. I okay? had so many. <laughs> <laughs> I thought they were just here for no one to Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to end with that, but I know it's on everybody's minds. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so thank much. You, thank thank you. you so much to all of you from the Civility Project for, for coming and talking with our students. It was um, really a great, um, a great event. So Appreciate thank you so much. Thank you.